So I think we all recognize that animal movement is a vastly important process. So animals move to find resources, to find mates, to avoid predators. And in doing so, they're circulating nutrients across ecosystems. And it's a fundamental ecosystem process. So the, I think one of the questions is, what are we losing from ecosystem function with this rapid decline in animal movements that we see globally? One of the main things is that the vast majority of species on our planet, actually we don't have very good information about movement, especially because many of the animals on our planet are far too small to be fit with some kind of tracking device. This also means that even though we can make some reasonable assessments about how animals respond to global change, we actually don't have very good information to make predictions into the future. Smithsonian is um, a longtime leader in research and discovery and movement ecology, um, starting with North American bird banding. We were the first ones to uh, bird bands in North America. And we we're also part of a collaboration to design the first satellite tracker. And so I put this up here because it's a rather cartoonishly, obviously, large collar. Um, but in the 1970s, Smithsonian collaborated with NASA and with two famed ecologists, the Craighead brothers, to fit this elk, um, known as Monique, with a collar that was connecting to the Nimbus 2 satellite. This collar weighed 25 pounds, so roughly 11 kilograms, so a massive device, and at the time cost $25,000 to manufacture. So it, it attracted a lot of attention, um, a lot of laughter that scientists actually would spend this much money to, to collect just a little bit of information about these elk. But 50 years later, look at where we are today. We have devices that fit in the palm of our hands that are just a few grams and are collecting not just hourly data, but minute data, even second data. So it really has inspired a generation of scientific research and discovery globally. The Smithsonian's Movement of Life project really comes down to what I think are five main tenets. The first of which is we need to increase our ability to track a greater variety of species across the world. Um, this is just the simple idea that how do you conserve an animal if you actually don't have the vital or most important information about where that animal goes throughout its lifetime. What we also are aiming to do is remove silos and actually try to work better together both within our own institution but also with partners globally. So how do we use the, the data that is already collected to address pertinent conservation questions? We're a small team, but we have some really um, well-known and very adept quantitative ecologists that are working on some of the statistical methods to better analyze the, the data that we are now collecting. And Smithsonian is a .edu, so we're not particularly an academic institution, but one of our missions actually is to empower our stakeholders. So that comes down to building um, partnerships with workshops. We offer internship opportunities. We invest in researchers, postdocs. Oftentimes, we're trying to get people to come and work with our team and spread the wealth and knowledge on how to analyze these data. And then lastly, Smithsonian is the largest museum complex in the world. And we receive roughly 30 million visitors in person. And so can we use the museum complex to better engage with the people that are coming across and coming in our front door and get people more interested in the wildlife, not just globally, but in their own backyard? To give you a sense of some of the projects, this is only the terrestrial projects that we're currently tracking globally. So we have about 45 species that we're tracking across every continent except for Antarctica and Australia with well over 2 million data points collected to date. To jump in a few of those projects, we were an early adapter of Earth Ranger, even before it was called Earth Ranger. So I really need to thank Jake Wall and the Save the Elephants team for, with this project, ingesting the tracking data for Asian elephants that we were uh, monitoring. In this case, we were monitoring Asian elephants 
for human elephant conflict, but in the first year of tra tracking, what we found is that there was an emerging poaching crisis in Myanmar. So seven out of the 19 animals in that first year were poached. And un unlike African elephants, these animals were being poached for their skin. So adults, juveniles, infants were all being targeted. The good news is that the predecessor to Earth Ranger also had alerts. And so this allowed us to raise the red flag. We were able to work with government officials. We were able to increase our poaching effort, uh, our patrol effort, and in a way reduce that, um, the poaching that was occurring in this country. Now, Myanmar is obviously a very difficult country to work in right now. We don't have any animals that we're currently tracking, so it's unknown what the poaching pressure right now is for the Asian elephant population. The second project that I wanted to highlight is, I think, our largest project that we have currently ongoing in Africa. This is the scimitar horned oryx reintroduction. Oryx is an extinct in the wild species, but has been bred in captivity for the past 30 years. So there is roughly 6,000 to 10,000 animals in captivity. This is a project that is led by the government of Chad and the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi, and it's implemented by the Sahara Conservation Fund. Smithsonian is one of the technical partners on this project. In 2016, we started reintroducing scimitar horned oryx from the captain breeding facility into a large protected area in central Chad. So this protected area, the Wadi Rime, Wadi Achim Faunal Reserve, is roughly a 95,000 square kilometer reserve in central Chad. It's an unfenced reserve. So it highlights the importance of tracking and real-time alerts. What I want you to notice from this video is that every single one of these adult oryx has been fitted with a GPS collar. This has really been the push from the Smithsonian to increase our understanding of how these animals, bred in captivity, are responding and adapting to this novel environment. But then secondly, we want to be able to understand reintroduction success. So are these animals living or dying? And are they reproducing? And that is one of the important aspects of using Earth Ranger for our field teams then to go out and track these individuals on a daily basis. Again, the importance is reproduction and any reintroduction. So just to show you a quick drone video. So our team, which is being facilitated by Earth Ranger, can go and find a female that recently gave birth. What you'll see here is one of our chatty and research assistants that have been monitoring the female, basically identified that the neonate, the newborn, had been stashed in this small bush. The research assistant will slowly creep up to that bush and then very quickly jump into the bush to get the animal and then very quickly get back into the vehicle before the mother comes back and tries to defend it. The field team then does a very, very quick exam of this animal. We evaluate the health of the individual. We take a quick blood sample. We sex the animal. And importantly, we give the animal a unique ear tag. All this information is then loaded into a mobile application and uploaded into Earth Ranger so that we can track population status and importantly, population growth. Just to give you an idea, since 2016, We've reintroduced nearly 270 adult oryx from Abu Dhabi. We've had over 200 calves born in the wild with roughly a calf survival rate of 70%, so extremely good. And now we have over 300 free-ranging oryx across this reserve. So extinct in the wild for 30 years, and now we're at 300. The other project that I wanted to highlight is the collaboration with the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. This is an African-wide African uh, effort in which we are attempting to understand the movements and the space use of all four species of giraffe. So northern giraffe, reticulated giraffe, Maasai giraffe, and southern giraffe. 
We're working from countries from Niger all the way down to Namibia. Now, with these data, we're start, starting to unravel how much space use do these animals need. On average, a giraffe is using roughly 350 square kilometers over its lifetime. Obviously, if you're in Namibia, dry land systems, more arid, you have a larger space requirement and you're also moving more per day. But all of this information can fit in directly to conservation management plans. The other piece that the Draft Conservation Foundation is really pushing on is using artificial intelligence and databases like Giraffe Spotter to make better estimates of the population. So using photo capture recapture surveys, we now have an estimate of approximately 117,000 giraffe, all four species of giraffe, across the continent. That's a small increase, a slight increase over the last 10 years. Part of that is due to improved conservation efforts and protections for giraffe, but largely it's due that our methods for estimating the population are far improved from when they were just a decade ago. So for the rest of the talk, about 10 minutes or so, I just want to focus on the Greater Mar ecosystem. This is a system that I've been working in for about 10 years. And we're really trying to address two key questions. The first of which is simply, how is this landscape, this important landscape, how is it changing? And number two, how are wildlife populations responding to these changes? So the important thing about this project is we are one of many different organizations that are working together to solve this problem. We're working with the Kenyan Wildlife Research and Training Institute, the Kenyan Wildlife Service, Kenyan Wildlife Trust, Giraffe Conservation Foundation, the Mar Elephant Project, universities like the University of Glasgow and the University of Twenty. We're also working very closely with Microsoft computer scientists. So they're donating, donating their time to help develop some of the AI. So I am not a computer scientist. I'm an ecologist and I'm trying to apply this technology. This first question on how is the landscape changing? This is a project we've been working very closely with Jake Wall and the Mar Elephant Project. Satellites certainly can be helpful to understand how the landscape is changing, but to get that really fine scale information, we need to collect it on the ground. So Jake has been deploying his team of rangers going out daily with Garmin inReach devices and collecting information on the ground. So for instance, where are the river crossings? Where's the patrol outposts? Where are the tourist lodges? Importantly, where is the fencing? And not just that the fencing exists, but when was the fence erected? When was it potentially taken down? Is it a three-line fence? Is it a five-line fence? Is it electrified? So all that attribute data that we can relate to animal movements that are also being incorporated into this Earth Ranger instance at the Mar Elephant Project. Importantly, this database is open source and has been published. So one of the things that Jake and I really want to be able to do is how do we expand this data set with the data dictionary that already exists and actually hand it off to other partners and grow it to other priority landscapes. To give you a feel for some of the data that are being collected, this is a figure that was published in the December 2021 issue of National Geographic. That entire issue was focused on the rapid changes that are occurring across the Serengeti Mara ecosystem in Kenya and Tanzania. The important thing that I really want to highlight is if we zoom into the center of the Greater Mara ecosystem just north of the Maasai Mara National Reserve, you see the Partimat Community Conservation Area. Every single one of these little fences, these pink polygons, those are all fences that the MEP team, the Mar Elephant Project team, has digitized over time. All these dots and the brown areas are all wildebeest that we've been tracking for the past 10 years. Most of this data was collected from 2010 to 2013, so a pre-fencing time across the Maasai Mara. And the arrow denotes the general movement patterns of this resident population of wildebeest across the region. Wildebeest are notoriously bad jumpers. 
And unfortunately, they get easily caught in many of the fences. So the other thing that Jake and I are talking about is how do we simply enable the rangers with a mobile app to collect the mortality that's occurring across this ecosystem. So can we quantify the real impact that fences are having on wildebeest, giraffe, the variety of other species across this ecosystem? The other thing that we can do is because we do have historical data on movement, so pre-fencing movement data, we can create simple models of connectivity, in this case, a circuitscape model, in which we can look at where animals 10 years ago were moving and then take that fencing data and overlap it with the movements. So we can prioritize which fences can be removed and where we can facilitate levels of connectivity and movement across the ecosystem. This means that we also can put a monetary value of what we would have to pay a landowner to remove those fences either temporarily or permanently to facilitate movement. The other piece that we're really trying to push on is this idea of how do we evaluate wildlife population responses. Of course, one of the most common way to count wildlife is from aerial platforms. In Kenya, in the Masai Mara, this has been done for nearly 50 years. And so it represents one of the best data sets, I think, globally on wildlife population changes. The challenge is that up until now, most of the time aerial surveys are conducted, the, it results in a manual analysis of all the information. So that means that it's quite labor intensive. It means that oftentimes from the time that the aerial survey is conducted, it often takes weeks, months, or sometimes years for a wildlife manager to get those results. Findings often can be error prone. So for instance, the current estimate of the Serengeti wildebeest population is 1.3 million animals. And it's been relatively stable over the past 30 to 40 years. But the error on that estimate is plus or minus 200,000. So in the short term, it's very difficult to determine is the population rising or falling. And of course, surveys are also extremely expensive. So can we use advanced technologies, deep learning, to number one, make these surveys less expensive, more accurate, and more efficient to collect? So in March of this year, together with that entire team, we conducted a four-day aerial survey across the Masai Mara. These are usually conducted by having a rear seat observer on both sides of the plane, looking out the plane and counting every wildlife that they see. And to make sure that we had continuity with previous surveys, we did that same thing. This flight was flown at 400 feet above, above ground level, but we added a digital camera to the belly port of the airplane. That camera was programmed to collect an image every two seconds along these flight transects. And so roughly we collected 11,000 images over that four day period, 650 gigabytes of data. To give you an idea of the quality of data that we were able to collect during the survey, this is one of the images. If I zoom in, you can clearly see that it's adult elephant. You can see its backbone. You can see the shadow of its tail, ears, tusk, trunk. So if we can see it, we can certainly train a computer to look through the remainder of the images and quickly and efficiently count them. The Masai Mara also is a heterogeneous landscape. So to give you an idea, in this case, just to zoom in, <coughs> even though it is bushy habitat, we can see the animals. We can see uh, a wildebeest up here in the upper left, but we see a small group of zebra as well. Importantly, we also can count livestock. So here we can see the cattle. And we also can see the sheep and goats. To perform the, the deep learning, we're using a platform called the Annotation Interface for Data-Driven Ecology, AIDE. I usually refer to this as the annotation, annotation interface that does everything because it doesn't matter what type of data you have. You can have camera trap data. You can have 
aerial survey data, you can have acoustic data. So any type of data where you need an analyst to manually train and then have the computer go through, this type of interface can be used. So this is developed by Microsoft. Uh, Benjamin Kellenberger is the lead architect. This is also a free and open source solution. The way that this works is it's an iterative process where simply you're using your browser where you log in and then you can bring up the images. The analyst would then go through this first image and for instance, simply put a box about around what he or she is seeing and then telling the computer that this, in fact, these three animals are elephants. The computer is then starts, the computer then starts to be trained and it will go through all the images and make a prediction. In this example, two of the animals were correctly identified as elephants and the third animal was, was identified as an object but not correctly as an elephant, just as an example. The analyst then would go in and correct the algorithm. So basically tell it that yes, these, all three of these animals are elephants. And this project process then repeats until we improve and we get a validation uh, metric that we're happy with. The interface also allows us to track our activity. So here you can see for the month from June to August how our team, which includes students at George Mason University in the US and includes students that are based at the Mar Elephant Project, but our um, Wildlife Research and Training Institute students, they were going through and annotating all of this under some direction. What you'll see here is that we've gone through roughly 30% of the images to date. So I mentioned that we collected 11,000 images. What we did is we separate those images into 16 subsets. We do that because it means that the images load much more quickly into the interface. And plus, it means we have a much more uh, extensive data set for calibration. So in effect, we have 180,000 images to go through. So we're still working through these images. So we don't have an end result just yet. But the goal here is to create as robust a model as possible so that the next time a survey is done, we don't go through this calibration stage. Instead, we use the model that's been developed. And then ideally, within hours to, at worst case, days, we could provide an estimate for species that we have a reliable model. Certainly cattle, sheep, and goats, we're seeing them extensively across the ecosystem, and we should be able to provide a very good, accurate estimate. So as far as next steps, what I'd really like to advocate for is experimentation and collaboration. So for instance, we flew this flight at 400 feet above ground level. We did so so that we had consistency with previous surveys. But what if we flew the same flight at 1,000 feet so we can cover a much broader area much more efficiently? What if we you know, start engaging with others that I'm sure many of you know, like Richard Lamprey, Howard Frederick, that have been pushing on using oblique camera counts. So try to get information of animals that are underneath the canopy and which you potentially can detect better from a oblique camera. So fly a survey where you still have rear seated observers, you have a nadir camera, and at the same time, you have oblique cameras. We need to really determine which of these species at any height that we're flying we can reliably detect. And then we also have to determine how well these models are transferable to other systems here in Kenya and also abroad. To highlight the one other piece that we're really pushing on, so as a US government institution, um, I can download and also task the US government satellites, so 30 centimeter resolution for experimental purposes. And I can do so free of charge. So in this case, with the MARA, we requested six images across this region, and we were successful in collecting high resolution cloud-free data. What we're pushing on now are developing or using the models that are currently developed to count some of the large mammals, especially cattle. So to give you an example, on the left, 
is cattle in aerial imagery, and on the right is cattle in 30 centimeter resolution imagery. So certainly the image quality is not the same, but if we know that those animals on the right are cattle, we again can train a computer to identify them. And so we have currently a paper that's in review. This is being led by the University of Twente by two researchers, Zijing Wu and Taijin Wang. So I would prefer in this case, if you take a picture that you don't share it because it is in review right now. But the important thing is that they have developed a deep learning algorithm, in this case, that's focused on counting wildebeest. If you look really closely, you see a series of dots across this image. We know ecologically at this time that the Serengeti population was, Serengeti population of wildebeest was in the northern part of the ecosystem, and we can verify that with satellite tracking devices that are on the animals. You can see also here a, a tourist vehicle. That tourist vehicle is re repelling the wildebeest from moving broadly. And here's just one other image where it might be hard to see, but again, you can see all the different dots across the image. You can see kind of consistent patterns that you would see with how wildebeest are moving. And from the images that we collected across the ecosystem, we were able to count roughly 500,000 wildebeest. So I think it's a major advance from where we have been in the, in the past. Still some work to do because we have to figure out how much misclassification there is between wildebeest and zebra and any other species that might be here. But in this case, we're very effectively able to differentiate a wildlife species from its background. So we're not misclassifying the shadows, the trees, or rocks, which are common problems. Um, across this type of landscape. So I'd like to stop there and just open things up for discussion. Just tough, you do know about the Cofenigo Zambezi Aerial Wildlife Survey. Yeah, it just happened, right? <clears throat> yeah, they just finished flying. It's all, it was all flown oblique and, um, and human observed so that you could do the comparison. 85,000 square kilometers, five countries. Um, so um, and Howard and Richard were both very much involved uh, with that, found, uh, funded by the Allen Foundation, yeah. uh, or partly funded by the Allen Foundation. So, um, and while we, I, I, I saw you mention them early on, uh, they're building the computer vision algorithms. Um, and, and I think one of the things to mention in all of this is um, it's great to figure out how to count, but what, what's done with the numbers, and of course, conservation management plans, but also policy. So, um, so all of that data is going to go to the um, African Elephant Specialist Group. We'll get incorporated into the status report, uh, which informs CITES policy. So that there were grants around all of those things to, to enable and fund uh, that whole process all the way through. So um, hopefully you're connecting with them and talking about those. Yeah, this is the whole reason for coming here and actually try to make those connections. I know that Richard arrived in Naivasha yesterday, so I'm hoping to talk to him directly in person tomorrow. And, and I'm, uh, the, I forget the street down, what do you call that? Uh, Nadir. Nadir. Um, I guess I'm one of the skeptics about Nadir. Um, I, I believe in obliques, but the comparison will be really informative to understand if Nadir is this is a lot. Um, the causes survey was performed with all obliques, um, and uh, and I think also tremendously important was the buy-in from from the uh, five member countries of CASA. So, uh, you know, the flights were flown by um, uh, uh, people from uh, Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, Angola, um, and, uh, and Zimbabwe. And uh, the first uh, surveys really flown over Angola. Uh, in a very long time, so very exciting that they were involved too. Yeah, my understanding is that they'll be flying Iona National Park in uh, Angola next month. Yeah, that, so African Parks is doing that one. That's not um, technically part of the Cabango Zambezi yeah. ecosystem, so it wasn't included in, in that survey, um, but African Parks um, is doing that. I think they do generally do total counts um, as opposed to uh, sample. Yeah, so I was just down there with um, African Parks discussing the different methods. I know that they're contracting with Mike Chase to do that survey. Yep. So lots of discussions on how to best 
monitor that system. Um, certainly here in the Mara, there was discussion on you know, whether we should be using oblique or nadir. Um, I think because the system is open, and certainly what we're seeing from the images, that it allows possibility with that type of imagery. It may not work for others that are, you know, much more, have greater bushy habitat. But I think from an artificial intelligence standpoint, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the nadir imagery is easier to fit into the program it, it than is. the oblique. And there, there have been a few experiments, experiments with nadir, and I think you're right, I think it depends on the landscape. If it's a pretty open <coughs> landscape, you're probably okay with nadir, and there are probably some landscapes where you really have to have the obliques to make it work. Yeah, completely agree. What's really exciting, um, and, and I just have to mention, because the Great Elephant Census, which uh, was funded by Bill Allen, was the first project I ever worked on in conservation. Uh, and I remember Paul saying, I can't believe it's the 21st century and we have humans staring out windows to count animals. So this is very exciting work because um, it, it, we're so close now to not doing that anymore and actually using the technology tools available to us to, to count animals, make it cheaper, and all of the things you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I'm also very excited and it seems like the people that are pushing on these technologies also seem to really want to work together yeah. rather than separately. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah. So I'm an optimist in assuming that AI is going to solve all this pretty easily in the next few years. Like, so just assume technical success. What are the other big bottlenecks that we need to be worrying about? Because um, just we're going to solve the technical stuff, I promise you. Yeah, I also agree that some of the, the technological aspects can be solved. I think we have to make sure, like Ted was mentioning, you know, how do we get the information directly into someone on the ground? Um, make sure that they have the information to make the decisions. I think that, for me, is the big one. You can, you can get splashy headlines about how we're losing all these elephants, but does that really matter? What really mattered was that the scientists who have the mandate to inform uh, international policy through the CITES um, convention, that they accepted those results and had that. And, and so really, if we drop the human observers and go with the, the um, computer vision observed stuff, but you can, you can go all the way back into the 40s and 50s when they were doing the surveys with the human observed and be able to, to follow those trend lines. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I have uh, one question. I mean, here we are really focusing on species conservation and monitoring at landscape level. Uh, we are working in a landscape where uh, we don't have any wildlife left, but we do have the landscape, which is actually intact in terms of habitat, ecosystem services, and so on. Uh, and, and we need data to be able to show to all the stakeholders around, like the mining companies and everything, that this habitat is very important. So uh, my question is, can we use this kind of interface also to uh, be able to collect data around the ecosystem services, around water especially. So are we already using that in this way? Um, what landscape are you working in? Uh, in Denmark. Where's that? So it's in uh, Eastern, uh, no, in South DRC. And it's, uh, I mean, you, you got the Pemba National Park and you also got the Mini National Park. And this is actually a big, uh, you know, landscape. It's one of the nine water towers that you have uh, in Africa. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, just thinking very quickly about your question, um, potentially is other people here that have a better answer, but certainly I'm thinking right away about assessing habitat suitability across your region. I mean, it's not what I'm talking about here, but certainly remote sensing would be a useful tool to assess, like if you wanted to reintroduce a particular animal using data from another area, you would be able to provide that type of information about how much of the land area is potentially suitable um, for a reintroduction? Yeah, but uh, like not only for reintroduction, but uh, I mean, uh, do we have anything who looks like a water? You know, rivers, flow <coughs> rivers, uh, you know, the, the health of rivers. Because I mean, we are also because we are in a mining region. I mean, electricity is certainly you know a big push, and and a big push for electricity is also dams. So I, I just want to know: Are we already looking also at, at this kind? You know, systems and how to protect these systems in the long run? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like what you, you need is 
I mean, I think Earth Ranger could help with collecting the data on the ground, so you could assess water flow, uh, water quality. All that information could be collected into a database that would help you assess ecosystem health for sure. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure off the top of my head other than that. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that question that you'd want to chime in. Co coverage over the, so the satellite coverage over those areas is pretty sparse and doesn't get collected very often, but um, we could certainly um, see what we have available. We, we do work with Maxar, who manages a lot of stuff, so we have to do a car and see if we can see what we have. Um, but yeah, I think you're right, remote sense is really the only way to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of remote sensing data sources that could be useful, many of which are free. Um, the high resolution stuff, I mean, like I was mentioning at the Smithsonian, we, we can task the satellite. I'm assuming your area is often covered with clouds, so that sometimes is limiting, but I think there's plenty of data that could be used. Yeah, in the back. Happy to talk to you. I think a working group would be really appropriate. Um, I think, yeah, as much communication we could have between groups. I think we're all pushing on the same thing with the same objectives. I was just say, I think I, I know of four, uh, and they've all been mentioned now, uh, the work that um, Janine is doing, um, the work you guys are doing in the MARA, the cause of survey, and I knew you guys would, it really should be a working group. Uh, we all have the same mission. Um, and, it's a really small community, the survey community. Um, we should use this as an opportunity to make that happen. Yeah, agree. Anybody else? Um, I'm here the rest of the conference, so I'm happy to talk to anybody. <laughs>